Hi, everybody, and welcome to our webinar tonight called The Science of Screen Time. And this is presented by Alberta Homeschooling Association. My name is Judy Arnell, and I am a homeschooling consultant, and I am certified brain and child development specialist in my work. So I hope to bring a bit of knowledge tonight on how um, kids grow, what they need in terms of screen time, and what that means for you as a homeschooling or an unschooling parent. So thanks for joining us. I also have written books. I written a book I'm on non-punitive parenting. So a book called Discipline Without Distress, which is all about solving parenting challenges in behavior and different stages, and also about how to get a grip like how to handle our stress, our anger, and our children's anger. And a new book out is Attachment Parenting Tips, and it's just about tips for, um, from my 23 years of facilitating parent groups. And the latest one is Unschooling to University because that's what we are. <laughs> we are a family that um, empower our children to learn according to their curiosity and pick what they want to learn and when they want to learn it. Hence, we have a lot of free time and we play a lot of video games. So I just want to space through all this. So. Okay, so we're going to look at how screen time affects children and what, is that a problem? Is that a good thing? I think my goal tonight is kind of to um, assure you that it's okay. <laughs> Everything's okay what you're doing, especially in this time we live in right now, parents are very much overusing screen time and we will not see the effects later. I'm quite sure everything will work out. So let's just talk a little bit about technology, addiction and parenting and what that means. So my information comes from Canadian Pediatric Society, Health Canada, Alberta Health Services, Palex Foundation, and the American Academy of Pediatrics. So we tend to have a little bias in our society. When we say, are we, are we teaching our kids literacy? We don't off, we think of, we're, are we teaching them how to read? <laughs> but literacy also involves media management. And you'll see that when your kids get to high school English, they have a whole section on media and, um, you know, ways to, to have a more healthier relationship with, with media and digital devices. So I tend to ask people, of this list, what is not technology? Let's, let's start there. Any guesses? Right. <laughs> Okay, yes, it is the strawberry. <laughs> the strawberry doesn't do anything for us other than just look beautiful and taste wonderful. So everything else is technology. So screen time is defined as anything with a screen that's electronic, right? I, I'm gonna just turn my video off so that um, we can concentrate on the screens. There we go. Um, so it can be movie players, all these things are what we call technology. And technology can be good or bad. It's neutral. It depends on how we use it and what we depend on it for. And it also depends on your child, what your child is like, what the content they're seeing is like, and in what context are they viewing that content. So it's very much. But Right now, the evidence, what does the evidence say? There are no clear evidence-based conclusions on the effect of technology on older children. So families come in various um, <laughs> points along the continuum. We have the families that are limiters and we have the families who are unlimiters and everybody else in between. And what wherever your family is along that continuum is what works for your family and i will disclose right now that we were a family of unlimiters so we had five kids and my partner it was an avid gamer so 
obviously that influenced the kids. I have four boys and none of them are into hockey, but they're all into PUBG or, you know, um, Overwatch or all those games. They're, that's what they do. They socialize over games. So right now there's no good research available to tell us the effect of screen time on um, older children. So we'll have to wait for it. So let's just talk a little bit about addictions because I often hear, oh, if I don't limit it, my child is addicted to it. Or my child has, um, just loves this stuff, he's addicted. And really let's look at what addiction actually is. So the question I tend to throw out is, is addiction caused by lack of willpower or is it brain impairment? Anyone want to guess? Right, it's brain impairment. Everybody has executive functioning skills and that's what we call self-control. But that ability to self-control is very much impacted by if the brain has grown up healthy or has some um, too much stress during childhood that it is impacting the ability for the brain to um, put those brakes on, put those controls on. What we call the prefrontal cortex is the brakes. The dopamine tends to be the accelerator. So addictions come in 10 different kinds. There's process addictions and there's substance addictions. So technology and screen time would fall under process or substance? Right, process, okay? So we don't have enough rigorous research. We don't know if our addiction <laughs> to technology is a cultural shift or is it a developmental stage during childhood? And so best practices from professionals is to say error on the side of caution. It's closest in nature to gambling addiction. And the best way to manage that is having moderation and life balance. That's very simple. But if you put it in perspective, society worried when books replace conversation and then TV replace books and now gaming is replacing books and conversation. But you know what? Young people today are very good at managing them. Like this is, this is a pub in Calgary and these young people are all playing cards at a pub. And you know, five minutes later, one person takes out their phone and the rest of them will, but then they'll put it away and get back to cards. <laughs> and that seems to be our new reality. <laughs> now back to brains. So genes are hereditary. So addiction is a gene and Yes, it is possible that children could inherit the family's addiction gene, okay? Genes are nature's blueprints, and it's kind of the embedded code in our brains and bodies. But nurturing is what's building, if you look at it as a house, nurturing is what's building our bodies to interact with each other. And through that nurturing, that genes may or may not express themselves. So the addiction gene may lie embedded in there until that person hits about a stress. And we still don't know if that stress triggers the addiction gene or another gene. We don't have enough research to tell us why some people it triggers it and other people it doesn't. So gene expression is based on things that we don't quite understand yet. But we do know what causes genes to express is stress. There are three types of stress. Positive stress, which is great. We need a, all need a little bit of stress in our lives to motivate us, um, challenge us to do things. And when we do them well, it builds our resiliency and our sense of confidence. Tolerable stress is the not so good stress, but 
if it's buffered by caring people and it's not ongoing, it does not impair brains. When it moves into toxic stress, it is prolonged, unpredictable, and it's not buffered by caring people. And that's the kind of stress that does cause brain impairment. So toxic stress is not good. And what keeps ordinary stress into the tolerable zone and keeps it from moving into the toxic zone is caring relationships, especially with adults. <clears throat> so if you have a home with minimal stress and you have a home with caring adults, your child will not get addicted to technology and screens no matter how long they're on them, okay? I wanna stress that. That is what the research shows, is that in functional, healthy families with caring relationships, long hours on technology are buffered by those caring relationships. It's when kids are neglected, they're abused, um, that is when addictions start having problematic concerns for those kids. Now, there are 10 addictions, like I said, they're substance and process. And what does addiction do? Addiction provides dopamine in the brain. So let's say we're having a really, really stressful day. We come home and we sit down with a glass of wine. That wine is feeding our dopamine need and it calms us down and relaxes us. But the problem, how it grows to be an addiction is when every time we feel stress, we want our glass of wine. <laughs> That's not good. So when kids are feeling stress and they feed it with food, that's not good either. So if children are using technology for fun, for entertainment, for play, rather than stress relief, it's probably a better use of technology. And if they have other things to do to calm their stresses, such as going for a walk, talking to someone, running on the treadmill, taking a time out and reading or hugging a teddy bear. Those are all very healthy ways to calm down that can also release dopamine and make people feel better other than that glass of wine or food. So as a parent, you want your child to have a few ways to handle stress that are super healthy. And we model it. <laughs> Absolutely. So these are what impairs brains. Uh, this is my list of 10 parenting no-nos. Um, and these, if children, most people grow up with one or zero. So about 70% grow up with one and they're fine. One ace is fine. When children grow up with three or more of these aces, and 15% of the population do, that's when it starts impairing brains and could express that addiction gene, okay? I just want to stress that. In most households, this, you know, one is okay, three or more is getting into that scary zone. And like I said, they build, right? So in a house where a child may have seven, ACEs, they are probably more at risk for gene expression for addictions. And again, adult support is a mitigating factor that changes toxic stress to tolerable stress by providing coping strategies. So that is the science on addiction. If a child in a healthy home plays 16 hours of video games and still has tech-free times or still has exercise, still has times they put into relationships, that child is not going to be addicted to screens. Okay, that's what the research says. In nurturing families with low ACEs, addictions are rare of any kind. 
Okay, so I'm going to quickly go through what age groups children use. Um, so children develop physically, cognitively, social, and emotional. Babies and toddlers are zero to three years. Um, recommended screen time for babies and toddlers, none. <laughs> According to the Canadian Pediatric Society, they came out with those recommendations in May of 2017. In October of 2015, the American Academy of Pediatrics came out with their recommendations, which they used to say none under age two, but now they say under 18 months, video chat with relatives is okay. And 20 minutes a day with a parent under age two is okay. So they're buckling under pressure. <laughs> but Canada, we're sticking with no screen time under two. And, you know, those are best practices recommendations. In my parent groups, I don't know anyone that follows them. I'd have to say the reality is that it's not happening. <laughs> if you look at all the new contraptions on the market, right? Doctors offices now have no books or boxes of toys. You bring your devices and put the kids on them. And <clears throat> this is problematic for children under age five because we're raising the silent generation. And it's showing up in studies. We do have studies of kids under five that do not, um, that show that children are very much lacking in language development because nobody's talking to them. We're on our devices, they're on their devices, everybody's silent. So um, about, oh, this is about five years ago, Alberta Education and Alberta Health Services worked together on the AC mapping project. And what that did was every child who went to kindergarten under age five were um, surveyed by a teacher and um, to assess a number of capacities. And what they found was that one in four children were at risk for language, social and emotional development by five years. In all socioeconomic status areas across Canada, <laughs> which was interesting. So even in West Vancouver, British properties, they had the same um, one in four children were lacking in social, emotional, and language competencies, same as anywhere else. <clears throat> and we know that because that sensitive period for learning language is actually in the first year of life and then definitely before age five. So as you can see, this language learning is really sensitive period um, for learning vocabulary, for learning um, expressing feelings, and that affects their social development too. If a little toddler can't say, no, I want that, you can't have my blocks, then what they're gonna do is hit the other child and that's not good. So they need language practice. Okay, and we can easily remedy that. We just need to engage our kids, young children, in books, reading, singing, and talking to them. And that's what we call serve and return interactions. And that's what builds brain connections. You can see them interacting here and playing a little game of peekaboo or um, you know Simon Says or bingo or whatever like that. Okay here's another thing you can do if you have to go out and keep kids busy don't put them on screens make this little kit of things they can play with. Um, in here we have play-doh, pipe cleaners, markers and paper, tape, flashlight, um, pens and what I do for my preteens is I throw a pack of cards in my purse. Nice, simple. Anytime we have waiting time for meals in restaurants, we play cards. It gets us talking, laughing, interacting, builds math skills, and um, it keeps them busy. So it's kind of fun to do. Okay, so that's zero to three. Preschoolers are three to five. 
Recommended screen time here is one hour a day, and both the Canadian Pediatric Society and Academy of um, Pediatrics, American Academy, agree on this one. Recommended physical activity for preschoolers is at three hours per day of active play and one hour of really sweat-inducing energetic play. School agers, six to 12 years, recommended screen time is under two hours. That used to be the recommended screen time 10 years ago. Now, both um, um, governing organizations say just have balance. So they don't even give hourly long. They just say have balance in your life. And I think that's a really, really good um, way to approach it. So the research does show that screen time should be limited from zero to five just to encourage language development. But after age five, there's no recommendation times and it's just live a balanced life. Um, school age children are re still recommended to have 30 minutes of physical activity a day. These are my kids. I told them one Sunday, I just had enough of watching them on screens. And I said, all right, you guys, that's it. Go outside and play. Done. Go. And half an hour later, I thought it was awfully quiet outside. So I go around the back door and I look and they're on the back deck playing Wii through a half inch of glass on the patio doors. So <laughs> kids are smart. <laughs> yes. but. Um, the good side is one of these kids I really worried about. I thought, oh my gosh, that is my screen addict. At seven years old, he played 16 hours of video games a day. He loved gaming. He loved computers. And guess what? Now he's an engineer and he works for a major video game manufacturer. <laughs> So don't rule it out. Kids love their passions. If they love gaming, if they love researching the internet, it's probably because they're going to go into a computer oriented career. Okay. Um, not going to talk about that or that. Um, so some safety tips is, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to go through this. People are very good now at encouraging their kids to be very wary on the internet. Um, even my kids in our family, I'm the one who got stuck with a phishing email that managed to um, bill my credit card. And my kids were laughing at me saying, you're the one who teaches this stuff. How did you get caught? And they have not been caught yet. So just um, you know, you want to encourage open communication. If kids are being bullied online, if they are um, having problems with somebody online, you want to have an open safety line for them and encourage them to come talk to you and you can problem solve it together. Okay, so if you are a family who wants to limit screen time, here's some good tips to do it set limits with your kids, not at your kids. So decide what your family screen time rules are and you have to buy by them too. <laughs> um, and I found that very helpful is to have a contract and a family conference. I think I have, I do. I have a contract on my website at professionalparenting.ca. If you look under articles tab, there's a non-punitive contract template that you can fill out with your kids and it gives you kind of things to think about what you want to establish your rules around. And the more they have input, the more they're likely to stick to it. Oh, here we go. Here's a sample. So it kind of says what the child agrees to. And on here, I had my non-negotiables. Never meet strangers in person without me knowing. And um, so those were for the child. These were for the parents. <laughs> These were our mutual agreements. And we all signed it and agreed to it. So it's kind of a nice way to just set down your rules and just have a plan. And we have to accept that social media is a part of life. 
The problem now with teenagers is social media is increasing their sense of um, anxiety and depression because they're worried constantly about FOMO, that somebody's talking about them. And in a homeschooling environment, that is very much reduced, I have to say. Um, kids are much less tied to that whole social media bullying, peer pressure that's happening in schools. When they're homeschooled, um, they tend to connect with other kids through real life activities, and then they cement those relationships through social media later. But it does really reduce their anxiety that they feel, and it helps better their mental health. It really does. And um, they have a lot more breaks from screens too. One thing I would suggest if you are a limiting family is do your negotiation before they get on the screens. <laughs> you have a lot more negotiation power then. <laughs> teenagers, 13 to 19 years. Now teenagers love their devices, absolutely. And it's because they're in that developmental stage where they're breaking free from family roles and family time. And they want to go into a playground that's not organized by adults. And that's okay. They're also exploring new social and sexual roles with anonymity. They can do research with anonymity. And um, it's good. They can be very creative online too. So they become um, transitioned from users to creators. And they can create some amazing stuff on there. Amazing. They can also do a lot of research. They can do a lot of learning online. Now with all the online um, a la carte courses opening up, it's there's so much content. And it's your job to teach them what's what's good, what's not good content. They become very savvy users. I am very impressed by today's young people. They are amazing. Your role is you're the problem solver behind the scenes. So you're the guide on the side, you're the advisor, and when they have a problem, they can come to you and you can help them brainstorm solutions. That's your job. And number one safety tip is don't drive and use technology. Oh, please, because they're watching you. If you do it, you're saying it's okay for them to do it, and you don't wanna be up worrying at nights. Okay. Asking permission is very good too. Um, we do have that habit in our family. I ask their permission to post any of their pictures on the internet. And I really wish I could share with you so much more about our unschooling life and the amazing things they produce and the amazing things they did. Um, but I can't, I don't have their permission to do that. They're very savvy on what they share on the internet. And I have to respect that. And they do the same with me. They ask if they can post something about me online. So it's really nice to have those boundaries. And as your children get older, it's going to be very important for them what you post about them online. And remember, parents matter more than media. You know, they, they love you. They respect you. They value your knowledge you can lend to them. And if we're nice to them, they'll help us do our pictures. <laughs> so we have seven keys of balance for us, and we need to incorporate tech-free times in our life too, just for our mental health and for sleeping. They recommend now to put devices away at least two hours before bedtime so that we can gear down. And it's not so much the back screen light anymore that's the problem. What it is is, because the internet and video games are very interactive, um, it stimulates our adrenaline. And anyone knows if you're ever angry, your adrenaline's on high alert. And that's what's stressing your body. And you can't sleep. So adrenaline has to calm down. You have to get off those devices before you can sleep. Um, I make it a habit now. I get off computers by three o'clock 
and I do not go on until the next morning because I might read something that keeps me awake and I'm stewing about it all night. So I'm very good at having healthy habits, social boundaries, and you can teach those to your kids too. I think that's the greatest gift. And remember, the important things in life, pay attention to them first. Ourselves, our family, our jobs, our hobbies, everything else in screen time is the sand that goes in between. But if you put the sand in first, you can't get those important things in that jar. There are many, many benefits of screen time. Yay! <laughs> uh, benefits of the internet. And I'm, this is um, a picture of grandma watching her son graduate from across the ocean. Like, that is so amazing. We, we, and right now, FaceTime, Zoom is just so wonderful to keep connected. You know, we need an app that can do that with hugs. <laughs> So there's lots of benefits of the internet. Um, I'm not gonna explain that because I think that's pretty well self-explanatory. Let's look at the benefits of gaming. Gaming teaches critical and analytical thinking and problem-solving skills. Um, so when children learn academics from age five to age 12, they won't remember much of the information that you either teach them in homeschooling or they learn in school. They won't remember most of that. What it does though, it's still good, it stimulates their neurons so that their brains make those connections and reinforce those connections. But gaming does the same thing. So whether they do a math workbook or they game, they're still growing their brain's neural connections. And gaming teaches kids critical thinking, problem solving. It teaches them how to manage information. It teaches them literacy skills, how to juggle competing interests under time constraints in some games, helps them develop pattern recognition and math operations too. And it's a medium for enhancing their creativity. Um, as you can see, my kids were wild of World of Warcraft. They didn't know what grade they were in. One time someone asked my daughter, what grade are you in? And she said, I'm level 80 hunter. <laughs> Technically she was in grade eight, but she didn't know that. <laughs> so, um, so literacy and numeracy are what kids really, really need to know. Everything else they can learn based on their interests or curiosity. Um, there's so much out there to learn, but knowing how to read, to write and to do math is the important part of academics. So with all those wonderful academic benefits, you gotta ask, how do you get your girls on the computer? Because they are definitely in the game world, they are definitely an extreme minority. So here's some ways that inspire creativity. They would paint their favorite games, they'd make little, um, stuffed animals of Kirby's and Pokemon, Pikachu's up there. Um, they made wooden characters of Kirby. They made costumes and paintings. Um, they, they did an amazing artwork. This is a Minecraft cake. This is a Zelda costume they helped sew. More artwork. In their play, they would play with the little stuffed characters and they'd imagine all these scenarios. That's creativity. There's our costumes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and as they get older, they enter um, comic fests. They do um, cosplay. They, um, and they problem solve how to do this all themselves. It's pretty amazing what they come up with. We even did it for special projects for credit, is making costumes and paintings. Okay, so just very creative people. Um, life skill benefits. It helps people zone out, relax. It teaches delayed gratification skills. Um, when you're leveling up or you're, I think the kids call it grinding, are those chores you gotta do to get to a certain level. Teaches focus, 
builds self-esteem and confidence when kids are good. And it provides practice in emotional intelligence. When they lose a game and they're mad, it, it's a, a way that they can learn how to um, relieve their anger, but in a positive, non-destructive way. Socialization benefits of gaming. Well, here's our living room central. <laughs> we, our kids all game together. It's kind of neat. I kind of like all our gaming system in one room. So I don't have kids alone in their bedrooms. Um, it helps team building, cooperation, group problem solving skills. So when they're all playing the same game as a team, they're saying, hey, on your side, or behind you, behind you, blah, blah, blah. So it's really neat to watch that. And they also can game with their siblings that are in other countries and other cities. They all get together at the same time and play games together and talk. So it's very nice. And this is a playground not micromanaged by adults. They need that. Absolutely need that. And it very much connects parents and siblings. Okay, that's kind of it what I have tonight. And um, research and resources, the Media Awareness Network provides good, um, you know, best practices. Kaiser Family Foundation, the Vanier Institute of the Family, Canadian Pediatric Society, and the Palix Foundation for brain information. Um, so I would love to open it up for questions now. If you have any concerns or questions, feel free to um, um, write them in the chat group. Okay, well, I guess we don't have any more questions. So um, I want to thank you for joining me tonight. And um, keep in touch. I have lots of um, information on my parenting blog and my education blog. I've done this presentation for a lot of schools, organizations, companies, and it's, it's really nice to know that it's, you know, especially in a time where we're finding it difficult to limit screen time, that it's not going to have long lasting effects if we buffer that with nurturing family relationships and low toxic stress levels. So <laughs> I hope that was helpful. Thank you for joining me and we'll see you again. Okay, have a good evening.